Hi, this is Arno. Welcome to the channel. Today I have a very special guest with me. I have Meher Roy, who is sort of like an idol of mine, and who he runs the very famous channel for decentralized technology discussion known as Epicenter. And today we are going to talk about what the projects that he is involved in and uh, where does he see that the space is headed in the future. So, hi Meher, how are you? Thank you, Anna. Great to be on Inching. Great, great. So, can you talk about your background and how did you actually uh, get into the blockchain space? Uh, sure. My background is kind of odd. Um, I, I studied biochemical engineering, bachelor's and master's at IIT Delhi. And I joined the pharmaceutical industry after I graduated from there. Always had a passing interest in investing. Um, read all of Warren Buffett's books quite early on in life. And when I came to know of Bitcoin in 2012, I was intrigued from the start. I felt a new form of money has to be a very fundamental technology because you know money is one of the great human inventions ultimately mon what is money money is just a social delusion right it's it's you and me and everyone else willing to call something valuable and we are all deluding ourselves into calling something valuable but if we all subscribe to this delusion then the beautiful engine that is our economy works. I think it's such a fundamental human invention, money. That a new form of money had to be a, a great invention. So I came across Bitcoin in 2012 through The Economist. Uh, got involved reading about it. Uh, even tried to purchase Bitcoin. Um, I remember in 2012, I went to, I was in India at that time, I went to my ICICA bank branch and Mount Gox was the only exchange at that time point. Created, created an order to send two and a half lakh rupees to Japan, Mount Gox, to buy Bitcoin. Remember there were worth three dollars at that time. Um, the interesting thing is, in, if you see the international remittance form in ICICI Bank, there is this field which is like reason for remittance. And I filled that field and said like to buy Bitcoin. And I gave it to the branch manager. The branch manager would say, to buy Bitcoin, what is this shit? Like, what is Bitcoin? And he didn't get it, but he took my form. Seven days later, I get a call from the head office, ICICI in Mumbai. They start asking me all sorts of weird questions. This is so something from this and that. Uh, and then, and then like they, I knew it was about this form. And they kept the phone down and like a few hours later, they emailed me that they rejected, they reject my remittance application. Because uh, under FEMA, buying Bitcoin is not a legitimate activity to remit money outside it. So apparently, I, that, that day I learned that under FEMA, you, are, you must comply to one of these purposes. And I see, I see I couldn't just understand what purpose to put to buy Bitcoin in. They didn't know anything about Bitcoin. It was not that they were stopping me from buying, but they just didn't know whether this would be allowed in the FEMA. So, you know, that was my first rush trying to buy Bitcoin in India. Um, ultimately, I succeeded, but one or one and a half years later, and only when I finally moved to Switzerland. Um, in 2013, the great Bitcoin bubble came. It went to a thousand dollars, and in 2014, I decided to make a career out of this. Um, very hard decision, since my education 
my background was in the vaccines industry and I I had never programmed in my life. In fact, never been interested in computer science. Uh, but programmer money caught my fancy. So I made this unconventional decision. Uh, it was a very uncomfortable decision for the next three years. Uh, especially for my family and friends. But in hindsight, it's the greatest decision I'll ever make in my life. Because I feel, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's just a great decision to, to be part of this industry. And like you yourself have made this decision. And it's, it's going to turn out really well for us, I think. Yeah, got it. Got it. So can you describe like how was the journey starting Epicenter and what was the exact point that you, I think you met with Brian and Sebastian a bit later on and uh, where do you see that? Where are you trying to uh, push Epicenter towards in the future? Um, And uh, some like, do you want to make it more mainstream because it's like one hour video, only techies watch it, but normal people who are trying to understand the technology behind various uh, coins and uh, various uh, protocols, um, they, they might actually uh, like something for them as well. I met, I met Brian almost entirely by chance. I was living in the city of Basel, Switzerland. And turns out that town is Brian's hometown. Okay. Um, so we got in touch because I did a podcast with another crypto show host called Arthur Falls. Brian heard that podcast, uh, heard me talk that I was in Basel. He liked the way I spoke on the podcast. And he wondered whether I'd make an interesting host. And he basically said, let's try two or three episodes. And since then, I've done perhaps 100 episodes until now. Personally, for me, this was an unexpected discovery that I would turn a podcast and uh, people would like the explanations I, I came up with. In hindsight, Epicenter was exactly the right podcast for me to join because Brian's background is in economics, his masters of economics from LSE, and Sebastian, the other host, his background is in marketing and management. So that show actually lacked an engineer and while I was not a computer scientist, I was an engineer that could ask engineering-like questions. Which is why it worked out well. Now the other question is, do we want to dial it down and um, make it easier for everyone rather than appeal to a niche audience? sort of a difficult question on on the one side like commercially that would be amazing so with epicenter we have around 35000 viewers per episode now across all the platforms and with our approach which is going into the technology deep down we will hit a wall maybe we will hit it at 100000 or if the space gets very massive 200000 or a quarter million but I think beyond that, we won't be able to grow. Whereas if we appeal to, if we made the topics easier, appeal to more people, maybe we could go into millions of viewers. So commercially, it makes a lot of sense to, to go there. On the other side, now you have CNBC in the game. CNBC, I've heard, has already four shows. Two running out of New York, two out of South Africa or something like that. If I look at the mainstream 
investing audience i doubt we are able to do a better job than cnbc at that market yeah. so maybe it is better that we stay technology heavy because out here cnbc has no particular edge in fact out here very few podcasts have any edge yeah. like we can we can keep our edge quite easily in this in this space because as we continue to host shows our networks become stronger our um, audience becomes more loyal and our questions become better as well and we become better hosts over time so there might be something to be said of just keeping this this niche and just doing this particular style well but but let's see uh like at epicenter we are going through a lot of changes now for the first time um we've hired a full time person to do marketing social media and product direction uh there's a uh, there's a uh, professional woman like she's for ola she's going to do all of these things and take epicenter in take have us make the big next jump the next big jump and it might be that she comes up with some brilliant ideas like either either we partner with a media company and we do it with a media company or we go into some other new disciplines or maybe we dial it down and make it more approachable remains to be seen i think yeah, yeah. got it got it um so can you share like how were the initial days of epicenter and how has the whole show evolved with time i think you personally would have learned a lot through your own guests asking questions learning a lot about blockchains um how has that uh, evolved over time how were the initial days were hard how has it changed right now so um success was unexpected at epicenter this started off in the the idea for this started off in the mind of sebastian who wanted to do this as a hobby project and he didn't even conceive that it would go so far um i feel with epicenter it's never been a very difficult journey uh, we've always had guests we've always had had like good users that sent us nice feedback and it's just one of these those things that we will do no matter how few people listen to it right right now we are lucky to have 35000 listeners but even if it were 1000 you would do it um the only thing that's that's happened is crypto grew unexpectedly and we got so many viewers and now the hard part is um we need to be sure about our guests like in, in the initial days guest is doing something interesting that's enough to invite them but now with 35000 people following your channel and maybe even making investment decisions based on these episodes you need to be very careful who you invite uh my my biggest concern is some day we'll fail at due diligence and we'll invest like invite a basically a scam project and our listeners will lose money uh so how do you exactly filter out all of these projects and only get good good guests uh, is sort of the biggest challenge now. got it got it um so we talked about epicenter and you have been in the space for quite a lot of time so can you talk about like what are some other projects uh, that you have been involved with and uh, yeah during that time and what where, where do you see uh you are what you are going in the space going to do in the space in the future so um 
I have consciously decided to um, like build products and uh, actually be you know, be on the technology side, like build products and lead technology teams to build these products. The the product I'm currently working on is uh, proof of stake validator for the Cosmos network. This is an upcoming uh, proof of stake network that seeks to build an internet of blockchains. Maybe we can talk about that later on. Uh, to me, the, the space of automated cryptocurrency asset management seems really exciting. Um, by automated cryptocurrency asset management, what I mean is when you have Indian rupees, um, you hardly keep Indian rupees uh, at your home in the form of cash. Like you will either go and put it in a bank or a fixed deposit, or you go to a mutual fund company and you give it to the mutual fund company and they'll buy shares and they'll produce returns. And They'll make your money grow. Or you might buy gold or something like that. But if you look at cryptocurrency today, people buy Bitcoin, people buy Ether in the expectation that they will go up in value and they pretty much do nothing with it. They just sit in some digital model. Um, I feel the future is lots of products and services in which companies essentially borrow these Bitcoin and Ether from the users, uh, use the Bitcoin and Ether to do some service for cryptocurrency networks and make an interest or return for these users. I'll give you a simple example. Lightning Network is becoming quite popular on Bitcoin. So imagine you have, imagine you have one Bitcoin and I run a lightning hub. Now, if you look at the structure of a lightning hub, a lightning hub needs to lock Bitcoins with other lightning hubs in order to become a good hub. So what if I borrowed your one Bitcoin and I borrowed it not just from you, but from a lot of people around the world. And I operated a lightning hub and I locked uh, these Bitcoins in these channels, in these payment channels. And then users use my Lightning Hub and I make some profits on the transaction fees. And then since I have borrowed one Bitcoin from you, um, I give you 1.05 Bitcoin after a year. And that 0 0.05 Bitcoin has been made through these transaction fees. So just as your Indian rupees grows at 7% a year through an FD, your Bitcoin stash might also grow using these services uh, that are going to do intelligent things with your Bitcoin. I think like this kind of space is totally underexplored. And I would like to explore uh, the interesting products uh, out here. Okay. Got it, got it. And you uh, are an investor as well in crypto. You analyze cryptos. You uh, look at a lot of various projects, the protocol level projects that are coming out, like new blockchains that people are building. You analyze such projects as well? Yes, I do analyze them. Uh, I, I analyze very few projects actually. Um, my focus probably this year and the next year is going to be fully on the infrastructure layer and scalability. And uh, I, I, restrict, I restrict my attention to projects that solve uh, infrastructure and scalability. Okay, okay. 
Um, so can you can we talk a bit about the scalability challenges like Ethereum? Uh, so I talked to a lot of founders who are actually building a lot uh, their own blockchains, like because of the fact that Ethereum has a lot of scalability challenges, uh, and even new blockchain platforms like EOS are trying to solve these, and uh, new are new blockchain platforms are coming into space. Um, I would really like uh, to know your insights in the space of what is happening currently. And do you see that uh, we are close to solving the scalability challenge in the smart contract platform and even in Bitcoin? Scanning out across the range of ideas uh, in scalability, I feel the industry is doing really well. Uh, scalability exists as a bottleneck today, but it won't be a bottleneck in five years. Um, I think we have all of the engineering tool sets that are needed to solve scalability. And the next big winners, the next big token winners are all going to emerge around scalability. That's that's my guess. Now, we could walk down into like why scalability is fundamentally solvable. Yeah. That would be great. So I feel there are at least four or five different approaches for scalability. Yeah. And out of these five approaches, two or three will succeed and and their success is multiplicative. Meaning uh, if three approaches succeed, something that makes all of these three work together is going to be uh, like mega scaling. So if you look at the approaches broadly, the first approach is generally to design better consensus algorithms that utilize bandwidth more efficiently. If you look at all of these networks, um, the fundamental constraint is A, bandwidth, and B, processing power. Right? So you have lots of nodes, and these nodes must send blocks to each other. Bandwidth is constrained. That means if blocks are massive, they won't propagate fast enough in the network. Yeah, yeah. And the second is, we want the node to be not a very high powered server, we want it to be a normal machine. So a normal machine can only process so many transactions uh, a second. Now, you could improve on the number of transactions a second just by improving on the consensus algorithm. Okay. So, if you look at Bitcoin, uh, like proof of work needs to have a very long block time, 10 minutes. But in that 10 minutes, what that 10 minutes ends up doing is uh, a lot of spare bandwidth is wasted. So my Bitcoin node receives a block, processes it in 20 seconds, and then is waiting for the next block to be solved for 10 minutes and doing nothing. Right? So my node is basically nine minutes and 40 seconds. It's, it's not doing, it's not working in any way. Uh, so Bitcoin doesn't use bandwidth and processing power of the nodes very effectively. So you can, you have the first approach is you have designed something better than proof of work that uses bandwidth and uh, processing power of the nodes much better. So when you look at uh, proof of stake, Casper, Cosmos, the consensus protocol used in Cosmos, which is practically Byzantine fault algorithms. You look at Hashgraph. Their fundamental edge of these consensus protocols is they use bandwidth much more effectively. So if you were going to run, if you were going to be a Cosmos node, your node is going to continuously receive and send transactions 
receive sign send receive sign send and it's always going to be kept busy uh, so these protocols use bandwidth and processing power of the nodes more effectively than bitcoin does which effectively allows them to be let's say a hundred times more scalable than bitcoin something like 10 to 100 times more scalable than bitcoin right of the bat now some of these new consensus algorithms claim they are a thousand times more scalable than bitcoin we don't know until we see these things in life but i i feel 10 to 100x 10x to 100x is definitely possible that kind of jump is possible then so that's one approach right and this approach is is definitely going to emerge because the engineering of this is pretty much solved there is a second approach the second approach is uh, the idea that a project like tezos will pursue for, for scaling so that idea is uh, the idea of proofs of correct block processing so let's say arnav you have a node in india and i have another node and you are participating in some consensus protocol let's say you downloaded a huge block a huge i don't know 20 gigabyte block and your node verified that the accounting in that 20 gigabyte block was correct normally what happens in bitcoin is like you will broadcast that block to me and i will also verify that 20 gigabyte block but what seems to be doable this is theoretically there, it's practically even half there is. You have these tool sets which are called zero knowledge proofs. Uh, you can also call them succinct computational proofs rather than zero knowledge proofs because that's the more relevant term here. So what, what, what can happen is you download a 20 gigabyte block, you verify that block, and then you create a succinct proof that basically states that your node downloaded this block and verified it and found it to be correct and this is the proof that you performed the verification correctly and then you send that 20 gigabyte block to me and you send me the proof i no longer need to verify those 20 gigabytes worth of data i can assume they are correct because i got the proof so if one node if one node verifies the accounting in a block the rest of the network can free ride off that load right? so that will save enormous amounts of processing power so right now in bitcoin that one mb block 10,000 nodes need to pro process that one mb block in the future it's going to be a 100 gb block only one node will verify that 100 gb block the rest of the nodes will just free ride on that one so we are going to save on a lot of processing effort with something like that. Right, so this is sort of the second approach. Then beyond that, beyond that comes uh, a family of approaches, which is um, the idea that we shouldn't have one blockchain, we should have hundreds of blockchains. And each of these blockchains can then process transactions in parallel. So this is the idea behind a network like Cosmos. Yeah. Right? So what happens in the Cosmos network is Arnav is an entrepreneur. Arnav wants to launch his own coin and his application. Arnav launches his own blockchain with his coin and application. Meher is an entrepreneur, launches coin and blockchain with his own application. There's Arnav coin, there's Meher coin. But then you teach how these blockchains to communicate with each other in such a way that if there's a user with 1000 earn of coin, that user can move those 1000 earn of coins from earn of chain to the hair chain, take advantage of the application in the hair chain, and then move it back to earn of chain. So, you know, you can have hundreds of blockchains, each processing in parallel. And um, so if, if one blockchain does 100 transactions a second, but there are a thousand blockchains like these working in parallel, a thousand multiplied by 100, that's like 100,000 transactions a second. 
Right? So this is the sort of Internet of Chains approach. Uh, the technology for it is ready. I think we'll see the beginning of the Internet of Chains this year. That's the third approach. The fourth approach is is a very interesting approach which is being pioneered by a project like um, our chain is the idea that you can make smart contracting way more efficient even inside a single blockchain. So their, their sort of idea is on Ethereum uh, you have transactions coming into the network but the way Ethereum works is, suppose, suppose I'm in India, Arnav in India, we are all in India, and there are a bunch of Indians that are sending each other around. And then there are a bunch of South Africans participating in the local economy with each other. The global Ethereum network must order all the Indian and South African transactions, meaning uh, transaction one from India, transaction two from South Africa, transaction three from South Africa, transaction four from India. It needs to arrive at consensus on the order of all of the transactions. What our chain will allow is for the Ethereum economy of in India to operate independently, and the Ethereum economy in South Africa to operate independently. And only those transactions in which money is going between between India and South Africa needs to go. Uh, needs to be ordered and arrive at consensus. So that sort of shrinks the amount of transactions that you need to process. So today, if Ethereum is processing a million transactions, with an Archain-like approach, you can just shrink it to needing to process just 10,000 transactions while achieving the same effect because many of the transactions are independent of each other. So you our chain like approach can basically shrink the number of transactions. And then fifth, you have all of these off chain approaches. Uh, lightning network, gradient network, true bit. So I think actually I, I feel all five are going to succeed. Maybe there is a number six and number seven I am not I do not know about. And all of these things are going to be multiplicated. So the consensus becomes more efficient. That's 100 eggs. Uh, you shrink the number of transactions needed. That's another 100 eggs. Interoperability is another 1,000 eggs. Off-chain is another 100 eggs. And ZKSNAP, succinct computation, is probably another 100 eggs. So somewhere when you multiply all of these things together, we increase transaction capacity a billion fold. And I think, I think that's going to be enough for the next 10 years. So things are looking especially bright. Got it, got it. Um, and so we have like decentralized acyclic graphs that people use and we have hash graphs projects like these. And uh, so can you talk about like what Ethereum and EOS and IOTA and Hashgraph, how are these uh, ecosystems all trying to solve that? Um, like Ethereum has tried to implement sharding, um, yeah, to solve the scalability challenge. So I think the easiest to talk about is IOTA. So, so, so the, there's two projects, there's IOTA and then there's Spectre. Yeah. And both of the approaches are uh, quite similar to And there's a third project called Byteball, and all three have like similar approaches. And the idea is, so today we have a, a blockchain. Like a blockchain is quite simple to visualize. It's basically a book. Right? Uh, a blockchain is basically this book. Each page, you can think of it as a block with a list of transactions, and then pages follow each other. Right? So page one, page two, page three. Uh, and on each page, you have a list of transactions that are, that are input by whoever is maintaining the chain, miners or stakeholders. 
the basic idea behind these projects is instead of having pages and instead of having a book which is like sequential um, they're going to have a data structure which is called a directed acyclic graph so now directed acyclic graph it, it means nothing for pretty much all of us but roughly roughly what it the way you could imagine it i guess is um, each transaction refers to just one transaction previously and then in turn other transactions refer to this transaction and so a sort of tree is formed a tree of transactions is formed it's not really a tree but roughly we can think of it as a tree and we are going to use some kind of data structure like that in order to uh, process transactions and hopefully achieve scalability now my personal feeling is uh, this approach isn't the most powerful one and and it's is not so because first like first of all iota like i think iota is a technically unsound project lots of people speculate on it but it's technically unsound the project that is sound in this space is spectre uh spectre spectre has been designed by these two academics from the hebrew university of jerusalem and and inspector has a massive limitation and that is that specter cannot be used a specter system cannot be used for smart contracts it can only be used as peer to peer money so you could implement bitcoin using specter but you cannot implement its ethereum using specter yet so i i feel that path of the technology tree is going to have a hard time unless we figure out how to implement smart contracts using that kind of consensus algorithm which hasn't happened yet to my knowledge uh that's the reason i did not mention it in sort of my scalability uh, conversation a different way you could look at it is effectively what this dag approach does is it tries to utilize band bandwidth more efficiently so it it is really part of that first category can we use the transaction processing capacity the cpu and bandwidth of individual nodes more efficiently and iota specter and byteball are methods to use bandwidth more efficient efficiently got it um so my hunch is there will be other methods that also use bandwidth more effectively so they realize some of the benefits of these approaches but yet allow smart contracts to happen um i think the thing to wait watch out for in that wing of technology is um, the emergence of a directed acyclic graph approach in which smart contracts are fundamentally possible okay. okay also by the way hash graph does not belong to this part of the of the tree hash graph is an entirely different idea okay okay uh, so i loved your insights on scalability and uh, i think you you uh, have a lot of interesting ideas you look at a lot of projects you talk to a lot of founders so what's the most interesting un unconventional idea that you believe in? yeah um so i come from biology background and uh, by far the most radical idea that i have come across in this space is <coughs> was first written down by ralph merkel as the inventor of the merkel tree so ralph merkel has in his paper writes that bitcoin is a new form of life Okay. It's a new form of digital life that pays humans in order to keep it going. He wrote a statement like that, 
And that's a very odd statement. Like, oh, Bitcoin is a living organism? Like, that's, 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 a, that's a strange statement. But then I got thinking on, on this idea. Right? Like, he didn't write much justification for, for it. Like, maybe he meant it as a poetic or metamorph, like, it was a metamorphic idea. So then I got thinking about it. And there is something super intriguing about this, and I'll tell you why. Yeah. So when you look at life, all life, um, biologists have had a hard time defining what is living and what is not living. Right? Like, how do you define like? This is living and this is not. Like, in well, human sense, it's very easy. I can see it and I'll, I'll know. But how do you formulate it as a set of rules for what is living and what is not living? It's genuinely, genuinely difficult. But you'll see that people usually settle down into a couple of different heuristics. The first kind of heuristic is that life forms they have configurations of matter that utilize energy in order to preserve information inside themselves. So, um, so if you look at your own body, your own body, each cell has DNA and you're eating food and the major thing your body is doing is it's like digesting that food and converting it into more cells, preserving your DNA. Right? Yeah. Even the simplest bacteria is going around the environment, eating food, energy, utilizing that energy and preserving the information that is in its own DNA. Right? So, that, so this is a characteristic of life. right? That life always seeks to preserve some information in the form of DNA. But you see Bitcoin, if you think of it, what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a configuration of matter, mining machines that utilize energy, electricity in order to preserve information. That is the Bitcoin core code base and the Bitcoin blockchain. Right? So it sort of matches, like Bitcoin totally matches, matches this thing. Now the second characteristic of life is that living organisms have a method of self-replication with variation and they undergo natural selection. So a bacteria splits into two, two daughter cells. They are all they are little different from the parent, right? Both of them have slightly different DNA. And then these two cells they will live in the environment and maybe split further and maybe one line will succeed more than the other. And this is the, this is Darwin's idea that, you know, uh, we replicate, we re reproduce, we replicate the information into other configurations of matter. And then there is like natural selection, which creates survival of the fittest. The strange thing is Bitcoin totally follows that. Like Bitcoin, the configuration of mining machines, it's consuming energy to preserve information, split into Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin Cash. So it's like this bacteria that is like splitting into two. So the bacteria almost, let's call it original Bitcoin, splitting into Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin Cash. Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin Cash, like just these two new bacteria have different DNA. Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin Cash have different DNA. The block size information is different, right? The core code base is different. And then once these two networks have split, yeah, yeah. They, they undergo natural selection, right? Like some people prefer Bitcoin Cash, people pay more attention to Bitcoin Cash. These two things compete with each other and maybe one will win much more than the other. Yeah. So there is the notion of splitting replication Variation and natural selection. So, crypto networks totally follow Darwin's natural selection algorithm. 
totally okay. <laughs> to the world yeah yeah then the third thing about about life is that forms of life can have an objective function so what do i mean an objective function um like a bacteria when you see a bacteria or a human the objective function is to survive and replicate yeah. you know ever since i was young my body is optimizing that i survive and i replicate and i produce children same for bacteria there is an objective behind me the configuration of matter now crypto networks today do not have objective functions like bitcoin the network it does not have any objective the human that is owning the coin has an objective he wants to see the price of bitcoin go up yeah. but the network as a whole doesn't have an objective but the ultimate strange thing that is happening is smart contracts allow us to build crypto networks with objective functions so so imagine imagine like there is i don't know an exchange protocol in ethereum decentralized exchange network on ethereum and there is this internal smart contract which has an objective function to maximize the number of orders that are being processed by the system and this smart contract is willing to pay the humans the developers money if they contribute code which improves its functionality which allows it to process more orders so this smart contract measures the total number of orders passing through the system and the total like any humans are committing code to the system and the smart contract calculates that because this human committed this code the number of orders the user experience improve and the number of orders increase so let's reward this human with 100 ether yeah so you could build an ai like agent at the center of each of these crypto networks that is going to pay the developers to propagate the system so you could build a crypto network with an objective function we haven't yet but yeah. we could yeah. and then this the crypto networks would be again like like life they have an objective to achieve a certain thing and then replicate so the more i think about it i think ralph merkel is is right in 50 50 years we will think of the them as new digital life forms uh and this is sort of unexpected because like as technologists we always thought they are going to in, in, invent artificial life it was inevitable but we always thought artificial life would be you know will have a physical form uh just like we have a physical form but i think mistakenly not even realizing it like satoshi has created the first digital artificial life in the yeah. form of bitcoin and not even he thought if he was doing that okay. yeah so that that is a very interesting thought um, i think it it would involve a lot of philosophical thinking as well um, which indians are very good at um, and uh, yeah i actually would uh, like to read more about it i would definitely read more about it Uh, yeah so coming to the last question uh, do you have any plans to uh, get involved with the blockchain ecosystem in india which is which is just just started to develop and we are having some more technical conferences and all that do you have some plans there so i i am quite involved with the blockchain ecosystem in india uh, okay. personally tried out all the apps uh, zepay unicoin coinex um and and i've been to a lot of meetups in delhi and in andhavar um it's still early days in the indian ecosystem i'm 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 actually interested to invest in indian startups in the cryptocurrency ecosystem so if 
some of you are building such a startup, just reach out to me. Um, and I'm also happy to connect um, people to people in the US uh, if if you think that's going to be productive. I think like crypto could be very big in India. Um, But of course, like the stance of the Indian government is quite unclear, and it it remains uh, an uncertain climate. But my my guess is, if if crypto succeeds in one of the Western nations, um, it will succeed in India. Huge. Yeah, yeah. Indian it's government will just of, follow. Indian government just follow. I think. What the U.S. government decides uh, till the time they aren't uh, clear what it is right now, they are just creating this uh, fud, so as to speak, in the market. Yeah, yeah. I I feel so. Um, it's a, it might also be a missed opportunity in in some senses. I have always felt uh, India should have a policy of creating uncontrolled controlled but uncontrolled technological experiments like my idea always has been for a place like india uh, for any new emerging technology like drones or cryptocurrency designate a city where you won't put any of the conventional regulations on businesses operating in that space in that city. So, for example, uh, you make Ahmedabad into a drone city. That would basically mean no no limitations on 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 drone making or drone flying in Ahmedabad, and free invitation to all of the companies globally to relocate there. But the experiment only stays in Ahmedabad. It does not extend to Surat. So, if there's some big mess that these companies are going to create, it's localized to Ahmedabad and it can be repaired. Right? It's not you know, spread out in the whole nation. So I've always felt like India should just pick all the technologies and just assign a city and let everything be free. Yeah. And you invite com companies globally and you see which city takes off. And it, it need not even be Ahmedabad or Bangalore, one of the mainstream cities. I mean, I don't know, do it in Ratlam. Yeah, yeah. Like make it make it make it completely open to do whatever business you want, whatever ICO you want to conduct out of Ratlam. Yeah. And see what happens. Yeah. So if if we were to be a little bit more intelligent about it, yes, there are massive risks, massive regulatory risks with cryptocurrency. But if we if we could just figure out some kind of SEZ or some kind of framework in which there is some place where which is a safe haven for all of these companies. Yeah. Not only in India but globally. That would be quite interesting strategically. Yeah, yeah. And India has the tech talent, like uh, for maybe so there are a lot of people who are involved in the services of ICOs and blockchain products, but not many people actually leading those projects out. So there is talent, but I think uh, there's lack of vision. Yeah. Yeah. But but you can actually bring vision and talent from outside. You don't need to have it yourself. Okay. Um, I think if if just there would be a safe haven where regulatory pressures were guaranteed to be off, yeah. and if we were we were one of the first countries to do it, I'm sure lots of people would relocate to India because. Talent is anyways cheap in India. Yeah. If there were regulatory clarity, why wouldn't I build my crypto exchange out of India? So, or why wouldn't I build a speculative product or service out of, out of India? Um, but, I, but I don't think the government will be able to do something like this. So, Sometimes I feel India is just too big for its own good. Like, you know, when things are big, you need to be very conservative. Like, if you're a small country, you can 
be more experimental because the lives of less people are at stake. The place like India is so big that if the central government messes up, a lot of people are going to be affected. Yeah. So conservatism has to be the dominant emotion. So the advantage of a place like Estonia is uh, three million people. They they can take the risk because their rewards will be very big. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if they succeed, whereas if they fail, they can contain it. It's just three million people, and you can go you still go and contain whatever mistake you made. But in a place like India, that just doesn't happen. Yeah. So, if we could have some kind of approach where we could take controlled risks as a, as a nation, um, that would be very useful. Got it. Got it. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Meher, for your insights, and thanks a lot for taking the time out and speaking to my audience and sharing so much. about uh, what is happening in the space and where do you see that the space is headed in the future cool it was great to talk to you adam okay okay and uh, for my audience please check out meher's uh, channel uh, epicenter i don't think it needs an introduction but still check out their weekly podcast their youtube channel they have great content there as well yeah okay bye 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 bye